caribou, even though they're not different species. It almost doesn't matter. These are, this is part of the caribou diversity of Canada. And this is what needs to be preserved. And so this is what gets assessed one by one by one. And what do we have here in Yukon? We have the barren ground caribou. This is not a picture from Yukon. It's from NWT by John Nagy. It's an extraordinary picture that I gasp at every time I see it. We have that, of course, in the porcupine herds that, we ta we, that we're here to celebrate today. But we also have northern mountain caribou in, um, in Yukon as well, and I won't be talking about that. But these are the two distinct types that, that we have right here in Yukon. So now I'm going to focus on barren ground caribou, which is um, the larger, the green blob that you see there in terms of its overall distribution that extends in Canada from Baffin, I Baffin Island to the Yukon border. But of course, we know that species do not uh, recognize these borders. It's very likely that the, that the three large barren ground herds um, in Alaska on the western um, uh, border with the porcupine herd are part of the same type, if you will, the same kind of caribou. So we'll talk about them sort of all at once. The Species at Risk Act is kind of parochial in the sense that it really only wants you to talk about Canada. Don't, don't go beyond that. And so artificially, we're kind of constrained into really just focusing on uh, caribou in the barren ground that are in Canada for the, uh, for the assessment. That's what gets legally recognized ultimately if it does. And so that's what I'll be talking about here, but putting the Alaskan herds into some context. The status report, I put it in big capital letters. This is the key, uh, sort of the, 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 the piece, the document that gets constructed under uh, several years of labor and lots and lots of input and forms the backbone of the assessment and also carries its way beyond that. That I'd like to acknowledge Anne Gunn in particular, who's in this audience, who's a key author of the status report along with Don Russell and Kim Poole through tireless work over this period of, through countless eyes looking and reviewing and, and uh, this report, we made it to the finish line somehow. Um, the report does get reviewed by uh, jurisdictions, the provincial governments, territorial governments, federal governments, wildlife management boards, the two caribou management boards in this case, so porcupine caribou management board. There's also one other caribou management board in Canada called the called the Beverly Caminaria uh, Management Board. And, and I'll introduce you to those herds in a second. But um, the stuff that the, that the status report needs to contain is information that will back up our ability to use those quantitative criteria that I showed you before. And, and, and this requires a lot of context for understanding the biology of the creature, how it relates to the landscape, what is at stake in terms of the key threats that are affecting the animal? What's the future outlook? And all these things. It tries to be as surgical as possible in this regard, but it can't help being a bit of a behemoth at the end of the day. But it is the one that's, uh, that, that uh, gets read by um, all 50 members of COSIWIC who then assess the animal at the end of the day. So we've heard about the other herds already. We haven't seen the map so much. But um, we, uh, we, if we're talking about all of Canada, this colorful map sort of shows how we see herd delineations today. The woolly wump sort of 14 to 15, it's like, can't you scientists ever like be you know, precise? Is because it is difficult to, because there is sometimes a lack of agreement on exactly the subpopulations here and there. And there's also changes over time that are both because of the way that we study the animals, we perceive them, um, but also because um, uh, the animals themselves change. But this is the snapshot today. There are about 10 large herds and about four or five smaller ones. Um, and this is how they're divided. Interestingly, if you look at one herd in the life cycle of a year, the movements are, are really, really important. Um, and I'll go back to this just to make one point that these are annual ranges of, of the herds, and, and you can see that they are very uh, different in size. They range from about 5,000 square kilometers of Coates Island caribou right there um, under Southampton Island 
to the considerably larger, like 460,000 square kilometer uh, caribou range, uh, home range of the Kamenuriak, which is, sorry, I should be pointing at things, which is uh, right here. Um, and, uh, and so they can be very variable in size. But if you, and they also can be variable in their movements. This is a wonderful schematic of, um, uh, of the Bathurst herd in, 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 uh, in the period of time in 1995 to 2007 with radio collars, where you can see that um, they have a fairly distinct calving area that then over time through, through all the way to the winter then is dispersed uh, along with uh, migratory, with, along with boreal uh, caribou, uh, often sharing the range in the winter all the way down to Saskatchewan um, and further, to be able to, um, uh, sorry, and then they retreat back and come back to these calving areas. These calving areas are ones that have a lot of faithful, um, uh, they, 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 sorry, quite a bit of fidelity that these animals return again and again to the area most of the time. Of course, there are some variation to that, but it is a distinct feature of caribou that is important for its conservation. And um, in terms of these journeys, these are some of the last animals that can enjoy these really large migratory spectacles uh, un, un, unimpeded. Um, and we're talking about large um, uh, migrations of 1,500 to 3,500 kilometers. Um, in distance, um, and so these are significant for um, the, the uh, uh, you know, the, again, inherent in the biology of the creature. Here is where it starts to get somber, because if you look and you collate all of the information of the survey information, and of course, it's not, uh, most surveys are, all surveys are done uh, by individual populations. And so this is the, and they're not done at the same time. So there is a, a, a fairly uh, difficult process of trying to piece that all together, get a good picture of each of the populations, and then amalgamate that into what is happening to the unit at large. And the picture is pretty bad in terms of almost every herd in Canada going downhill, and some not known. And then a couple, the Southampton Island, a very small population, and then our porcupine herd, which will be sta in stable or increasing condition. Um, and there are other changes that have been found, and this is a map that was produced by the government of NWT based on uh, in, in, um, interviews in indigenous communities showing that the range just over the past period of time has also retracted. Um, and this is just an effort to map that information. And again, the porcupine herd has held somewhat steady in this regard. This, you don't have to look at all these numbers except to see that this is how we put together the information on each of the populations. We looked at the surveys that have been done over uh, the first and last surveys and, um, and their particular um, situation in terms of their current status, whether they're declining or not. We have an estimate of about 800,000 800, animals today, but we also have a, bat, of a crude f estimate of about two mil, over two million animals in the early 90s. So you can see that as a whole, that marks a very significant decline with quite a lot of unknowns in there. And in fact, when we look at the detailed information where there's been quite a bit of surveys over time on seven herds, which collectively represent 70% of the population, we simulated um, decline rates over three generations based and bringing in a number of times the, uh, being able to incorporate the uncertainty by looking at what was the decline rate if we took this generation time versus another one and bringing in other elements of uncertainty at the same time. Punchline, because I don't want to bore you with all those details, we have uh, sort of relative declines um, coming up as fairly steep for a number of these larger herds, except porcupine again, and an overall decline of that 70% portion of over 50%. Um, I forget what the point I was going to make here. Oh, yes. So of those 70%, um, then what's going on with the other herds that we don't have particularly good information on? Well, we still know that Baffin Island has definitely declined. We don't have a lot of points. We only have two. We only know that they were about 200,000 animals back in the early 90s. Um, or actually, it was back, yeah, in the early 90s, potentially. And they've, they're not more than 3,000 or so today. 
And so that's a significant decline. However, we can't quantify it with any kind of certainty because we're not so sure about the previous estimate and there haven't been very many estimates in between or any, any good ones at all. The Beverly Hayek has been a bit of a mess in terms of being able to quantify and particularly because the, the, there haven't been uh, large and consistent surveys of the same areas, but it is clear at least qualitatively that some sort of decline is occurring and it might be as steep as some of the others that we've been seeing. We also have the picture in Alaska with the four, three herds and some statistics that have come out fairly recently is the Central Arctic herd, which is just adjacent to the porcupine, went from 70,000 animals in 2010 to 22,000 this past year. And this was announced in 2016. Western Arctic has had a similarly difficult decline. So the picture across the board is, is not very good. At the same time, we know, and, um, and, and, the com and this is very clear to any of the northern residents who also have um, indigenous knowledge going back many generations before the surveys, that herds have fluctuated over time. And there's a notion that this happens about every 40 to 60 years. And, and with a few animals where we have data going back, we've seen this. This is the Western Arctic herd that has shown that naturally the, 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 there have been ebbs and flows. But as Joe said, we don't know if this is going to happen. And a lot has changed on the ranges which give us pause and make us concerned. Um, and so it feels like things are a little bit different now than they used to be. And so when we took all that information, we quantified the declines over that, um, over the large portion of the range, and don't worry about any of this verbiage, except to say that this is a, um, a, 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 a process whereby we look at the quantitative criteria and then we bring in some other factors. In this situation, although it qualified as endangered because it had an over 50% decline overall, we, um, we actually assessed it as threatened for a number of factors that included the, the relatively good situation with the porcupine herd. It included um, the fact that the, nat that the fluctuations may, there is a possibility of it, of it returning at some point, even though there's more concerns the other way. It also, there has been a lot of work going on in the communities. Um, and with each re respect with each herd of, of actually concerted management efforts that, that give some hope that things will turn around potentially. But overall, the, 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 the picture was one of a great deal of concern. And indeed, like we know that the pressures are coming from the south. We've quantified these with road, just this is the road development map that is startling when you look at this combined, not just the primary roads and highways, but it goes well beyond uh, human settlement at the at 100 and 200 square uh, 100 uh, kilometer radius from the border, because it also takes into account the nat the natural resource development pressures that have been coming on to these um, um, these areas. But this is also happening in the north, and this is we saw the cumulative impacts map of the cumulative footprint map of porcupine caribou that Sebastian showed. But this sort of blurry map is the Bathurst herd and uh, a bit of a schematic looking at forecasting if all of the mine proposals that we know about today and roads come through. One of the worst case scenarios is a, is a very fragmented range with large roads, resource roads coming through. And this kind of thing starts to nibble away and cause more and more pressure. We also know the pressures of climate change that are occurring and, um, and we'll probably hear more about that in the forthcoming presentations. So just to end, what's next after this assessment? The assessment is out there. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a scientific assessment that has brought in no considerations of socioeconomic concerns. The next stage is when the government decides whether or not they will list the species, which could then promulgate some or stimulate some uh, <coughs> recovery actions and, and also some um, investment by the federal government potentially in helping to um, uh, uh, aid management boards and communities in, um, in, in the recovery work that needs to occur. Um, and uh, so this, but this is one stage in a very large and complicated process. And to be quite frank, many species don't make it this far. And what we see at Kosiwik is that very little action occurs. Uh, not, not all of our species get listed because of socioeconomic concerns. Uh, maybe 85% of them, but even them, even when they have a recovery strategy, very little action happens. So again and again, we come back to the table after 10 years 
and we're assessing species that are declining further and further. We recommended for barren ground caribou that we reassess this animal in five years. We wanted to see if there was any promising um, signs in the recruitment. We want to see what's happening with the porcupine caribou herd when it gets assessed and all these things. Um, and that may change a picture. In five years, a lot can happen. But um, this, for the moment, is where we are. And when things don't get listed, I just wanted to say that even uh, the, spe at the species at risk uh, registry, the COSIWIC status is always transparent and um, comparable against the schedule, so the SARA status. And so, for example, for this one species, you can see that uh, the, the, the feds uh, accepted the endangered status of this particular animal. But in this case, which was a marine fish, even though Kosiwik deemed it threatened because of large declines, it received no status and it was declined um, by uh, the federal government. That was their decision, so it's not considered a species at risk. So this is the kind of information that at least is transparent. So I'll end that and ask for any questions. I hope that that fills in some um, some of the context, the broader context, and now we can talk about the porcupine herd again. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, I'll just uh, give Christy a mic, and uh, Justina can ask questions. Yeah. Ans can answer, Christy. Answer. Well, can you pull up and share okay. The yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah. I'm going to keep this, or you're going to yeah. take this. Okay. Any questions for Justina? <laughs> okay, lots. Uh, I think I saw your hand first. I'm just wondering if you could speak to some of the reasons for the declines of the individual herds, whether uh, it be climate change or. I'm actually going <laughs> to. Uh, yeah, there, there. It is a, probably a constellation of factors, but I'm going to leave that to my colleague Anne Gunn, who's going to talk about the disturbance and, and other issues related to caribou. Thanks. Um, I've had this sort of question in my mind for a while, and perhaps you could help me with it. Um, I'd heard the suggestion from some um, that the porcupine caribou herd might have had some additions from Alaskan herds, um, and I was wondering if there's any uh, evidence to that effect, or if you could tell me anything about that. Yeah, but I think that's a better question to ask uh, Joe and, and others, but... Um, just to say that it's never clean. Um, there's always some degree of interchange, but remarkably little uh, on, in, in the scheme of things. So that did not factor, factor in. Is there a question over here? Did you want to? Yeah. Just going back early in your presentation where you showed all the, the fur and stuff being exploited. Um, as... I don't know if everybody in here knows, but the community where I come from, Aklavik, in the Northwest Territories, it was the muskrat capital of the world. And um, we used to go trapping every year, and we'd get 5,000 to 7,000 muskrat. And, you know, we'd hunt in our area that was around our camp, and we thought we shot every muskrat there was, and next year we'd go and we'd get another 3,000 or 7,000. And um, just going back on to people in, the, in, their, in our area during the um, search for oil and gas, people have moved away from trapping and have gone into working in industry. And um, within the past five years or seven years, I guess, the people have been going back to hunting muskrat. And in our area, there's hardly any. You know, people would go out and they'd get six or seven a night. And But since they've started harvesting those muskrat, now people are getting over 300 a night again. You know, the muskrat are coming back. It's the same thing with, um, we never seen link in our, you know, around our communities when, and people have been trapping them and snaring them now, and now we're, people are getting over 200 link. So, you know, that, kind of 
you ha I sit on the HTC board, so we, the Hunters and Trappers Committee. So we're kind of leery when we see stuff like that, you know, and saying, well, you know, you have to do your management or, you know, on, on what we see. And also, um, Dolly Varden Char, they were, they quit harvesting in the community. The government said the numbers were declining. So that was in 1980, and three years ago we got a, a scientific license to go and harvest for the community at the fish hole. And the first couple of years we harvested 125, but we, you know, we had a, and uh, this year one sweep and we got over 600 char and, uh, you know, so I think, I'm not saying that we're gonna go out and harvest everything because that doesn't, you have to, you know, do your, it's pretty tough to manage when you're sitting on there. But also when the government kind of threw, threw a, a wrench into things when they imported a bunch of muskox to the, to, uh, well, it was to Alaska, and they all migrated and came through Alaska. They were totally protected. And then they moved into the Yukon where they were partly protected. But they prefer to stay right where everybody is able. We don't have a management plan in Northwest Territories for the muskox on the North Slope, so people harvest them and they, they've been staying there. But that's what people have say, been saying, that there's no, the caribou have changed their migration route and they figured it might be because of the muskox. Hmm. And also on Baffin Island, I sit on the Inuvalut Game Council and their, their problem is they said when there's muskox there, all the caribou move out. So, so the government have, you know, they, they've imported a kind of a problem. And also with beavers now, they're so high in numbers in our communities that they're f messing up all the fishing creeks and building dams and wrecking that. So, so all of these factors we take in and we consider, but you know, there's, it's a little bit of a tough job to try and manage when you, things don't go the way you think they, they would be going, you know, because you're harvesting and now that you harvest them, the numbers are going way up. So. I'm not saying go out and shoot all the caribou, but I mean, you know, we have to, things go in cycles, I think, and the way it shows on the thing, and it's what we've been noticing. I'm gonna sneak in here, because I have the microphone. Um, thank you, Justine, I really enjoyed that presentation. I, I admit to having very little idea about, I, I thought Kosiuk was governmental. Um, and what a, an, a, what a massive job 50 people have. 75,000 species in Canada? Is that 70, but we, don't, so, we yeah. don't do even a fraction of that. Yeah, still, what a, what a big job, um, so thank you. <laughs> um, I sense some thinly veiled frustration. You talked about this loop where Kosiwik assesses, but then you know the, the next nine stages don't happen. And even when you have a recovery strategy in place for um, is it the, w the woodland or the boreal caribou that CPAWS uh, National has just launched a lawsuit against the federal government for inaction on that uh, recovery strategy? It seems like even when you have a recovery strategy, not necessary, y things may not be happening. So what would your advice be to us to what needs to change to have a, a process that is functioning better and is, is producing the the results that it was intended to, um, a fully functioning process where you move from assessment to the end goal of recovery or protection. Advice for us on what we can do to, to help. We're preaching to the converted in this room, I can feel it. So it's, this, is, this is really, uh, it, it's, it's, it, it's, it's rooted in, in the importance of biodiversity and where it ranks with respect to other, other um, Things <laughs> so socioeconomic um, issues and such, and so where where the importance of biodiversity is elevated or not, and what is going to be the investment by government. So it's a lot. A lot of it has to do with amount of investment that's willing. I mean, the the the, um, the budget of, of the Species at Risk Act is a fraction of of other other uh, acts that get implemented, 
And for example, I mean, and this is not a northern situ situation, but in the southern parts of Canada where there are tons of species at risk and lots of private land, there could be much more investment in stewardship and, and, and such uh, things that will require, which would require money and attention. It also, in, in if you get further north in the case of Boreal, it's gonna require some hard choices. And uh, there, it is likely that we cannot save everything. And if you get, what ends up happening often is that, and we've seen this in southern uh, BC and in uh, southern and in almost throughout Alberta is that we've got herds that are in such poor shape that they can only survive with intensive management. And in particular areas, for example, they'll have to shoot 150 wolves every year uh, in order for them to survive. In other places, they're penning the caribou and releasing them or they're translocating them. These are really, really expensive measures to save the last uh, individuals when there was a lot more that could have been done proactively earlier. So I think, um, I think that's the message, for example, that Joe was giving today with, you know, we're, we've got a good situation. Porcupine caribou herd in, in, in that there was proactive attention made to harvest measures, even when they didn't know if the, if the herd was declining or not. And right now, he's pro they're proactively thinking about what can be done about ensuring that the cumulative impacts don't get out of hand. And uh, so here, we, we should look to places where we still have opportunity and be as proactive as possible. And uh, that's, that requires a, a lot more than just a Species at Risk Act. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, Justine is also going to be talking on the panel this afternoon, so if we haven't gotten to your questions, then you can ask her um, this afternoon. Yeah, just in that same uh, line, uh, another one of the problems that I've seen is that you have a piece of federal legislation that is declaring these species um, as endangered or whatever, uh, but many of the species um, the responsibility for managing them is the provincial and territorial government. And you get this little bit of a pissing match going back and forth about who's going to take the lead on developing the plan. And the, it's going to be expensive to develop the plan. And I know that was a problem with the Northern Mountain Caribou Plan, where the Yukon government basically said, we're not going to do it. It's a federal government declared it as in danger or threatened. And you're going to have to take the lead on it. And the federal government eventually did. But I'm just wondering, is that a problem in other areas of... Uh, Canada as well? Yeah, I mean, it's an issue. That's part of the reason I took the time to um, show the, uh, the accord from 1996 that all the provinces and uh, territories signed. Also making clear the point that, you know, these species do not observe jurisdictional boundaries, that it requires sort of this coordination. The Canadian Constitution is very particular about who has the authority. And of course, uh, a lot of these um, uh, you know, areas that are at stake and animals are under provincial and territorial authority. However, um, in some parts of the country, there, there are, uh, is endangered species legislation so that, you know, it gets adopted from the federal scale and then implemented. And so there's a bit more cooperation, but not always. And that's partly, that's a lot of the reason why I showed that map to, to explain that that's, that's quite a checkerboard. But then even so there's uh, this, everything has a checkerboard of responsibility and it's not limited to Species at Risk Act. It's also related to environmental assessment in many cases, but not so much in here, but uh, certainly down in the provinces. There's the Canadian Environmental Assessment Act, but then it's supposed to play with the provincial equivalents, which are often dramatically different. So it's a problem that's not particular to the Species at Risk Act. The power of the Species at Risk Act, I think, is that, that sort of federal or national, not federal, because that sounds political, but a national scale look at how a species is faring. And, uh, you know, a, 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 look, a look from a, a sort of a bird's eye view where you can see where the issues are for a particular species. And then a recovery strategy that provides a blueprint that can be then be implemented. That has a lot of power, but the implementation just hasn't happened for, for a lot of the reasons that you say and others as well. I think that's it. <laughs> Okay, thanks.